the final panel, we've, the first topic is going to be this. Why have the market conditions been difficult? And what can we do about them? So that's the first topic. The second topic is about really talking about the disruptions that we've talked about, which are long-term in nature. And the question here is, how do we translate that long-term re reality, that long-term disruption, into short-term actions? How do we build that bridge between the long-term and the short-term? And thirdly, we're going to talk about diamond financing, which is an integral part of the supply chain. You can argue it's a supply chain by itself. When a diamond company buys from a major miner, like our Rosa or De Beers or many others, it pays cash. And then it has to finance its own processing and often sells rough or polished diamonds on credit. And credit flows throughout the whole supply chain. So the questions here are, how will diamond banking evolve? And in particular, how will financing evolve and respond to the disruptions we've been talking about earlier? So three topics, current market conditions, building a bridge between the short term and the long term, and diamond financing. That's a big ask for the final panel, especially towards the end of the day. And I'd like your help in asking and sending through as many questions as you can. What we're hoping for today, as I said at the beginning, is to give you a starting point so you can take these conversations back home and develop your own strategies. So I've got a lot of, I've got real pleasure in introducing that final panel, which consists of Davy Blomart, who heads up diamond financing here at NBF in Dubai, Biju Patnayak, who heads up, heads up gem and jewelry financing at Indus In Bank in India, Jim Pounds, who heads up sales and marketing at Dominion, and our very own Martin Leake, who you've seen plenty of already from DMCC. Welcome. You have to sit in order. Thank you. You have probably been listening through all the panels, which, as we've discussed, are quite long-term in nature. And, Davy, I really want to start with you, because you finance Diamantes as your core business. Correct. And this year has been very tough for diamond dealers. So my first question to you would be, why do you think Diamantes have struggled so much this year? Mm, the main reason why I think that they have struggled so much is... Okay, let me start off by saying I'm, a, I'm an optimist. By nature, I'm an optimist and I'm optimistic for the future because consumer demand is still there. Um, now, what we do have seen is that there has been a glut, an overhang of polished in the midstream because the mining market is no longer 100% controlled like by the beers like it was so many years ago. It's spread out over many more mining companies. All these mining companies have targets to maintain, they have shareholders that they have to please, they have to have short-term gains. So everybody is trying to sell as much as possible and make as much profit this quarter, this half year, this year, which is causing everybody to try to sell as much as possible into the midstream. Midstream is buying that and creating so much polished, which there is an unsync, it's, it's no longer in sync, the polish which is getting created and the polish which is there is demand. Now, that has created this glut, and then it's simple economics between supply and demand, which has caused all the problems which we have seen. Now, what has been happening to resolve this? A Couple of things. The miners are getting to understand that you need to do much more generic advertisement. So I was very happy when I was uh, in Hong Kong last week, uh, where the beers were showing all the marketing activities that they have planned, and then the DPA, all trying to boost the consumer demand for polished. On the other hand, what we have seen is also now miners 
are cutting back on supply. Now, that was my specific request to all the miners who I've met. Please, please keep tight control on supply. Because still there is a lot of polished in Bombay, still there is a lot of polished out there, problems are not yet resolved. Now, do I see problems getting resolved? I, I also can predict the future. Will it take another one month, two months, four months? I don't know for that polished overhang to clear out. Market is going to start picking up again. Now then, everybody needs to be responsible and not start dumping rough on the market and manufacturers also have to be responsible by then not starting to manufacture like there is no tomorrow again. What I always like to make a reference to is the high-end switch luxury watches. All these people, let it be Audemars Piguet, let it be Patek Philippe, they have a demand for 100,000 watches and on purpose they manufacture only 50,000. They can easily boost their sales and the profitability by making 100,000. It's just cranking up the machine. They don't do it because they want to create value. And I had a, actually a good discussion uh, with one of my clients this afternoon during the breaks where people have lost touch with this rarity of a diamond. It Davey, just before we go on, I definitely want to pick up on those topics because we're going to be talking a lot about rarity. Mm -hmm. BJ, I want to bring you in before we look at solutions. How have you seen the market? Do you want, because you've got a very good perspective in India. Would you like to build or take a view on what, on what Davey just said, on current market conditions and why they've been so bad? <coughs> Thank you. Current market situation, you know, has been continuing from November 2018. Uh, during November 2018, when the polished was sold and during that time the rough prices on which our clients bought rough. Subsequently, la last year in December during Thanksgiving and Christmas, the sales didn't happen to that extent. So, the, there was a lot of police stocks which were there in US and other centers. And subsequently, the raw prices did not go down because there is so much of stock and to make it viable. Rather, the raw prices continued as it is and people for some time thought there is hope and they went on buying that. Uh, that increased probably a lot of stock in the midstream that was, uh, uh, that was at a price in which it is not selling. And, and that is... Sure. Now, please continue, sorry. Yeah, there is second issue is, you know, uh, our customers who are in the midstream, they are buying always rough diamonds with advanced remittance. And when the goods come and after 90 days or 120 days when they are selling, there is a time gap and that risk they are always carrying. So that risk from November to February they were carrying, but when these goods were ready and they were trying to sell, and there was uh, price was down. And that has created, that's continuing probably for the first time after 2008, it's continuing for almost a year now. Now we are again to next Diwali. So this situation, subsequently we know that uh, mining companies are coming and they have said you can probably return part of the goods or you can reject part of the goods. But there is always the other part, whether that's profitable or that's not profitable. So with this, there is a sort of uh, situation today where we are all in is uh, that everybody is expecting that things should improve. But you know, we all of us know hope is no strategy. You can't just hope things will change. So Biju, just to kind of ask you directly then on that, do you expect things to improve and over what time frame? Like Devi, I am also an optimist and I see there is uh, not so much of demand fall from US. Mm -hmm. That's very positive because that's the most important market. 
we are very concerned with Hong Kong, China, which is another major market for us. Mm. And there, there is uh, uh, quite a bit of goods are not going. We don't know whether it is an artificial situation because of the uh, situation in Hong Kong and the trade war that's uh, still not resolved between US and China. Is that the reason that people are uh, holding on to the manufacturing of jewelry? Because you know most of the diamond from India go to Hong Kong mm. for manufacturing in Panyu, Duangong and Sanjian areas. So there those cells have been stuck. So dossiers which are 30 point or say above, we have seen there is a bit of glot in that category. Okay. I think one of the things you've mentioned, BG, sorry, I'm kind of homing in on you here, is you talked about buying rough that's not profitable. In your experience and your recommendation, do you believe that actually Diamantaire should never buy rough from miners if it's not profitable? Yes and no, because they don't know what will be the price of the polished after 90 days or something. So they are always taking, there is a gap in time. Second, as uh, nobody knows better than the mining companies what would be the polished price in three months, six months uh, from today than the uh, small manufacturers in India or anywhere else. Because you know our business is organized in such a way, the supply side, the mining companies are giants like D. Bears and Alroja. And the manufacturers essentially are small companies. Mm. Uh, they, uh, so there, you don't have so much of a bargaining power with uh, big giants uh, who are there in the supply side. In the supply side. And traditionally, they have been doing, and this was going on forever because dealers always maintained the price. Mm -hmm. So subsequently, we still have two major players, dealers and Alroja. And uh, uh, but the issue is they are aware of the problem. We are interacting with them. They have been proactive in discussing mm -hmm. with us, but we have not been able to bring in a solution mm -hmm. where people come back to profitability. So. Davey, just coming back to you on this, I think earlier this year in the recent few months, and it's a bit unfair to talk about this without anyone from ABN AMRO being present, but ABN, ABN AMRO sent a letter to their customers really questioning and challenging the notion that they would finance goods unless they were profitable. What was your view on that at the time and what do you think now? The philosophy behind it, I fully, fully agree. But as Biju was also saying, a yes and no answer, it's a very difficult line to go. Because each and every, on the one hand, I sympathize with the CEOs of the mining companies. They, at the end of the day, they're responsible to create shareholder value for their companies. If they can sell their diamonds for X amount of dollars, it's their duty to sell them for X amount of dollars. Now, a diamond company, on the other hand, says, we are 100 site holders or whatever, whatever. If I'm not buying, there is going to be somebody else who is going to pick it up, and I'm not going to have goods. So if another guy is paying $100, I also need to buy $100. Although, actually, he knows that $100, he's not going to make a profit. So you actually need a CEO of a, of a mining company to come up and say, look, I know that I can sell it at $100, but in order for a long-term goal of the health of the industry, I'm going to sell it at $95. But how the hell, as a CEO of a mining company, are you going to convey this message to your shareholder? I have no, I have no answer on that. So how to do. The problem is that the buying side is so diverse, you have to actually come up as a block and say, no, we are not going to pay more than $95. Do you think that that dynamic between buyer and seller at Miner and Diamantair, uh, you know, whether it's at Arosa, De Beers, or any other mining company, do you think that's the core, one of the core challenges? That's a big challenge. Okay. That's a big challenge. And 
that's where a lot of companies are at. They say, I only want to pay $95 because I will only come out at $95. But then there is another company saying, no, no, because I want to become a site holder, I want to show some muscle, I want to do this, I want to do that, mm. I will pay $100. I mean, I want to, I mean, we can explore this debate in a bit more detail. I think there are many topics to discuss. I think economic theory would be that if you consistently overpay for a product, over time, you cannot sustain your business. Correct. And even if you don't buy the goods today and you miss out on supply, if you end up being the last business standing or one of the few, then actually if you take a long-term view, which is something that people said in the previous panel, maybe, maybe that is the way forward. Maybe you've just got to take that long-term view and take that short-term hit in supply. I mean, I'm not proposing a solution. I think, Jim, I definitely want to bring you into this conversation. Uh, it, you know, I know that you look like the youngest here, but it turns out you're the most experienced. The picture's the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> the I only, thought that picture was the oldest this picture. morning. I thought that was <laughs> You've seen, I guess, in your, in your short, youthful career, a couple of downturns. Bede, you referenced 2008, 2009. How does this particular downturn compare to previous ones? Well, firstly, uh, you know, the, the macroeconomic session in 2008 and 2009 was very different to this one. We do have uh, macroeconomic challenges, uh, and we, we also react within Dominion. We, act, we react the same uh, with our clients. We work in a relationship business. Uh, we all do. I mean, not just Dominion. Our Rosa, De Beers, and everybody. And that relationship is vital to the continuity of our business. You know, and we want to keep closer. We're, we're 6% of the market. We don't have the, the challenges that an Arosa or, or a De Beers does. You know, we, we can tailor make our parcels mm. and we can, we can make the adjustments and, and keep all our clients happy and keep, keep, do our best because we realize that our clients have social responsibilities mm. to their staff. They have responsibilities to their uh, online suppliers um, and, and, of course, to the banks. So, you know, it's, it's one thing for us to say that's the way forward, you know, we work closely with your clients. We can do it. Mm. Others can't. So I think you've just got to be able to listen and, and really uh, see your way through it. So, like you said, I've seen ups and downs in this business. Every up has a different set of factors, and certainly every down has a different set of factors. And the factors we're seeing in this down certainly have changed uh, certain things, and notwithstanding the, the macroeconomic uh, headwinds that we're facing, but also, you know, the, the, the stance that the banks have taken, uh, which I think is, is very, very positive. And I, and I think that everybody's now thinking in the medium to long term. We're miners. We don't think short term. Mm -hmm. we, we only think long term. We, that's, you know, I spent most of yesterday on the telephone about projects that probably I will never see actually being mined. You know, I, I would have, you know, moved on to pastures green-ish. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it, that investment wasn't made. I mean, yeah, sorry. No, to what extent do you think today's downturn or the downturn we've had is a cyclical downturn versus a structural or are there elements of both? In elements of demand, um, I, I think it could be cyclical, but I think we do have to approach... Uh, this, these new millennials in a very different way and the generation Z or Z as I would call it uh, in a very different way as well and, and I, there's a wonderful article in the Sibjo uh, on the Sibjo website written by um, good lord the, the gentleman from De Beers whose name has just come completely out of my head Jonathan Kendall Jonathan Kendall thank you very much I, I apologise Jonathan if you're in the crowd um, who said we should all have 20 year old mentors Mm. And I, that really resonated with me. You know, mentors are generally older and wiser than, than you are. It's not many older than me, but it's, uh, you know, something <laughs> that I think that we need to feed back into our business. Which way these young people are thinking about diamonds and the purchasing power of diamonds. We've been talking for so long that millennials are almost become baby boomers by the time. No, we, but we've got to, you know, we've got to go on and do something about this and listen to what they want. So there are many, many different factors, but we will, we will listen. We will provide what they want, and whether it's a Canada-marked diamond with all the traceability, provenance, 
and authenticity, I think that's a very, very big word uh, that we provide. And, you know, we've got to be able to work closer and closer and closer together, otherwise this downturn will last longer than the others and have more casualties. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. And I want to kind of quickly go back to you, Biju, because one of the things Davey was talking about, how there are 100 diamond companies and they're all kind of working with one company, just to kind of ask you straight up, do we just have too many people in the midstream, too many diamantaires? I wouldn't say that because, you know, it's a very democratic place and everybody has ambition to do things. So how many players can come to a business, whether we can control that, restrict that, that's not a very fair thing to do. And so, uh, but I think whatever production that takes place, uh, that should be, uh, like Devi said, maybe should be having some bearing with the demand. Mm. And this time the problem, I don't think so much of a demand and production. It's a time gap in the pricing of the product at the manufacturing center and the product that's uh, there in demand at whatever price. Mm. So that is where the gap is there. Mm. And that gap uh, is unfortunately not getting bridged over a long period of time. In 2008, uh, since uh, both Jim and I were there and we were also facing the same issue together, I can tell you this, uh, this got over in uh, three, four months. Mm. Uh, again, the profitability was there very much in the business. But this time, uh, the profitability hasn't returned, mm. though quite a considerable time has elapsed. Martin, you were also there in 2008, 2009. You were running sales and marketing at BHP Billet and Diamonds at that time. If you were still doing that job today and assuming that BHP was still in the diamond business, how would you react to the current crisis as a miner? Um, so you're asking me to put an old hat on when I had more hair. Um, I would react exactly the same. Um, I still stand by what we did was the best thing for everybody in the industry. So for those unfamiliar of what happened in 2008, 2009 is that um, we launched an online auction system where we sold all our diamonds through a spot market and a long-term market via auction. And um, the financial crisis hit, and that was in response of a corporate desire to sell all the commodities that BHP was selling at the market price of a day, every day. And the financial crisis hit, copper went down 70%, um, nickel was down 85%, the Baltic exchange went down 93%, and diamonds went down 32.11%. I remember that number very well, it was the 100th sale from Akati. And we saw demand, and we saw that was for market price, so we sold at that price. And I think it was the first time that diamonds had actually reacted like rough diamonds had, had gone like that. And that was partly because of a structural change which had been going on for the last 15 10, 15 years, in diamonds was no longer controlled by a monopolist. We saw fragmentation in the upstream. We saw new productions coming in, and miners want to sell to pay their miners. We want to keep cash flow going. Mm. And you've got to sell at the best market price. We're not subsidizing businesses. We're looking after our shareholders. Mm. So that was the, the reaction then. And um, I've always said, when you sell in, a, in an auction-based system, you've got to also allow the customers to make some money. So that's why we didn't take the top price, we took a clearing price. Davey, we just to kind of jump to you for a moment, uh, Jim, just before you re react to that potentially as well, is the question I've got for you, Davey, is that what do you think needs to happen between now and the end of the year to bring the market back into a healthy equilibrium? Miners need to hold back on production. Don't let too much rough go in. Even if the market starts picking up, please don't flood the markets with rough diamonds because the moment the market is going to pick up, the site holders are gonna demand goods because factories have been running very low. Everybody wants to get into action, so there's gonna be a lot of demand for goods. Hold back on the goods because the moment you open the floodgates, again, 
it's going to go down. Profitability needs to come back in. Now, how can you bring profitability back in? By reducing the price, which personally I don't think is a good idea because that brings morale down, it brings polished prices down. But you can bring profitability back in by improving your assortments. If you improve your assortments, you give some life oxygen to the clients. So improve assortments, give some oxygen back to the companies, and hold tight on supply. Jim, I want to kind of just take your view on this. The idea that supply is somehow restricted, both at the rough end and at the manufacturing end, is a, is a remedy that's been doing the rounds in the market over the last six to eight weeks a great deal. First of all, do you agree with that? And second of all, do you think that there are demand side issues that need to change too? I do, and I think I, I relate in that, and some of the work we're doing in the DPA would, is, mm. is definitely focused on changing, changing the attitude, changing, changing the, the, the actual buying process and the, uh, you know, how, how the uh, buyers of today react when they go into a jewellery store and making sure the story they hear mm. is, is the correct one. But, you know, as Davy said, just holding back goods off the market, it rather is you know, a sort of a, an old way of doing things, but making sure that the goods that you do put to your clients are what they want, uh, and, you know, improving assortments, as you said, David, uh, and, and making sure there's no overlap. Because you do an overlap, those goods are just coming back onto the market against you. So, um, I, you know, we have to react on a number of levels to see us through this. And, and with the support of the banks and, and the other producers. But more importantly, as I keep saying, that we do have to make the buying uh, of, of jewelry, uh, making sure that that process is uh, a fundamental enjoyment mm. uh, and, and reflects the, the beautiful nature of our natural product. I think that is a very, very good summary of the current status. What I want to do is look at the longer term view now, because we spent quite a lot of time talking about disruption. And Jim, maybe starting with you, can I quickly ask you, of everything you've seen and heard so far today, if you could pick one issue that you thought was the single biggest issue that our industry faces, what would it be? Uh, I, th I do think it is getting the right product to the right people with the right message and making sure that the diamond, the love of diamonds, love of natural diamonds or synthetic, I mean, if it's, it's, you know, mm. we'll do the part of the business now, uh, is, is, mm. is put over in a story that makes that process and that very important moment in people's lives mm. uh, an exciting and, and uh, rewarding prospect. Davy, how did you react to the lab-grown panel and the panel on automation? To be very much honest, your lab-grown production is only 2%, and it gets 33% of the time of all the slots. So it's getting a huge forum, which is actually, according to my humble opinion, over-inflating the importance. So with the downturn, all my clients, all of them, from the first to the last, blame the downturn on synthetics, where I completely disagree. When I'm saying you're blaming something on something which is not even 2% of the market. Now, do I see a future for synthetics? Yes, sir. I see a good future for synthetics as a completely separate product. Because synthetics is artificially made, you can make as many of them, as many as you want, you crank up the machine, and it comes out. So it will not store value. As a bank, will I ever finance, purchase finance for synthetics? No, because something that's worth $100 today will be worth $50 tomorrow, will be worth $3 the day after. So how am I going to finance that? It's like USB, when a USB stick came out, you had to pay for it. Now, you get it for free everywhere. Now, is it a nice, nice piece of jewelry? Yeah, sure, why not? 
but is it something that stores value? For me, yes. Now, that's for somebody like me who is in the industry on a day-in, day-out basis. Now, if it's very important for the people in the natural business to clearly differentiate this difference, and there is a difference, because some people are saying there is no difference, diamonds are diamonds. If there was no difference, then you couldn't find the difference in a lab as well. When you certify it, you can easily see what is a synthetic and what is a natural. If you see what, if there's a difference, if there, you can make two different certificates, yes, there is a difference. So you need to now educate the consumer. I think, I mean, I think that it is a very fair point that the current market conditions are unlikely to be caused by lab-grown. I think that the purpose of the debate earlier is that even if a situation is at an early stage, yeah. if it poses significant risk to the industry, then it's worth having that discussion. Can I just interject? Sure. I think confusion is the most frightening word in our yes. business. Yep. And the confusion at a retail level, I think, is, is something that both sides of, 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 of the business, both lab-grown and, and natural, need to really uh, get rid of mm. uh, in the consumer's mind. Uh, Absolutely. Because that, that is value destroying at every level. Absolutely. And yeah. I, think, I think the idea of, of lab-grown diamonds, it may not affect the current market conditions, but there is an argument to be made, and I just want to test this with you, that not resolving the distinction between lab-grown and natural has reduced confidence in people in the supply chain to hold stock of the natural product. So you've ended up in a situation where retailers hold less stock. You see that the midstream seems less keen to hold stock. And in the end, actually, some of that stocking burden has gone to miners. That may well be the most credit worthy, and they may well be the best people to hold it. But what we're seeing is a, is a, is a, is a, is a greater degree of reluctance to hold stock throughout the supply chain in general terms. BJ, I would just like you to comment on that if you see it the same way. And, and how you see that sentiment and confusion point that Jim is making. I, I feel uh, I agree with uh, Debbie and Jim that lab grown is not created the current situation. That's very uh, uh, insignificant part of what business we are all in. Uh, lab grown, uh, whether it's going to stay, yes, it will stay. It has a place, it can stay. What I see today in the lab grown uh, session, there was a talk about most of the site holders will probably be uh, lab grown producer or lab grown distributors. I think that euphoria or the little bit of interest that has developed because in the natural diamond today there is no profit and people want to be employed in somewhere and make some money today. And uh, I see that with uh, my clients, that there is uh, some, some option is available because only thing our clients know is uh, how to make this business, cutting diamond and selling diamonds and jewelry. So they think probably they have gone for that. It's uh, uh, for the natural people going there as a line of business, I see there are two patterns. One is since there is nothing else to do, there is no profit here. If you go to Bharat Diamond Bourse, everybody is screaming. In that situation, somewhere there is a little money, however insignificant it is, let's grab it. Second is, uh, as families are expanding, you try to create some time, a little bit of some business for somebody who is new in the, into the family business. So I don't see in the long term it's a, a disruption which will have a very large bearing on the natural diamonds. I don't see that at all. I don't see that as a risk factor for me to bother in the long term while financing uh, to this industry. So, I mean, in a way, I mean, one of the reasons that you've talked about is that people are moving into lab-grown, or some of, some of the Diamantes are moving into lab-grown, because actually they want to make money. They can't see an easy way of making money out of the natural business. So some of them are migrating or diversifying into lab-grown, so that's one motive. You didn't say it directly, 
there could be a second motive as businesses expand, as you mentioned, that people want to hedge and watch the space, right? Do you think that, in a way, that type of activity adds to the confusion or is a sensible business decision? That'd be one. And second of all, do you believe that the root cause is a lack of belief in, in natural rather than a belief in lab-grown? Since both are two products, they are two different products. So uh, there are good fences, make good neighbors. So they can be good neighbors inside a store. I don't see that uh, one uh, interrupting the other or there is a lot of overlapping mm. of those goods. That probably the world has dealt with um, by not mixing and selling the lab-grown diamond as natural. That's bad and that has been dealt with in many ways with Al Roger's machine, DBS machine, etc. to identify. Uh, I think these two things will go uh, uh, hand in hand and this product will continue uh, as a product. We have seen many such products, uh, Swarovski, there's that many products we have seen. So like this it will be a product and uh, synthetics or uh, at, uh, imitation jewelry or artificial stone jewelry, these things are part of the business. So this will continue in that way. I don't see they are in conflict with each other. Okay, uh, and I think that's, that's a kind of a fair point. Martin, I want to come to you because DMCC did run a lab-grown diamond test. <coughs> Can you talk through what your thinking was when you made that decision? Yeah, sure. Um, lab-grown diamonds are a legal product. And I believe Stephen said it yesterday that the strategy which De Beers came up with 15, 20 years ago around the 3Ds, differentiation, disclosure and detection, is still valid. Um, we are a multi-commodity trading centre at DMCC and we trade in many different commodities and lab-grown diamonds is another commodity, we're a legal product. We put certain rules in place around hosting that tender, um, around clear disclosure, around no mixing, around requesting that all participants sign a declaration that when they resell the product, that they clearly disclose it and they use the approved terminology according to the Sibjo Blue Book and the FTC standards. And um, we have to compete. We can't close Pandora's box. Lab-grown diamonds are here. So we have to embrace that change. As uh, um, we talked about today, we've got to start building windmills and look for opportunities around that. Yeah. And we've got to sell our product for what it is. You never sell diamonds because they're crystalline carbon. You sell diamonds because of a diamond dream. And that's what we've got to be better at. And I thought the last panel session around that, I think everyone spoke extremely mm. elegantly about making sure we sell the product for what it is on the positive merits rather than on in what it isn't and the negative side of things. If we throw mud, we'll all get dirty. We need to start to sell the, the aspiration of a diamond. Jim, you are, have been very active at Dominion on the Canada Mark program. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would be worth just talking through that for a moment and to what extent that relates to a strategy to promote natural diamonds or build more confidence in it. Yeah, it is, it is a, a, as I said just before, it's a confidence in the traceability, the authenticity and the provenance of the diamond. And I, I, I think it was uh, in the first session when Farid said it's his dream to be able to mine a diamond, polish it and set, set it in jewellery. That is absolutely my dream as well. Mine a diamond in the morning, polish it by, by lunchtime, set it in Canadian gold, uh, and then sell it to Greater Thunberg in the evening. So, <laughs> because she's, she's already designed it the evening before. <laughs> I mean, it's just having that sort of level of authenticity is just wonderful. And we're lucky. Uh, you know, we, we deal in a product coming from one country, and, and we do know that there is a resonance for that. It's a North American diamond. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we can sell it into those markets uh, for a proven, uh, you know, extra profit. You know, there, there is a definite, um, you know, 
reason for, for, for selling that. But, as much as we are putting that out to one side and benefiting from that, I, I am concerned in the growing tribalism of the, of the world that we live in. Um, when does that American di North American diamond also get, be a, a LGD produced in America and mm. sold along those lines? When does that become a Chinese diamond produced in China, made with Chinese golds and sold as a product like that? So whilst it's a great uh, you know, uh, benefit uh, on driving price for us, I think it comes with risks. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think that is an in interesting point because when you start combining it with the earlier topic of automated manufacturing, now nobody said this in the panel, so I don't want to put this, these words in anybody's mouths, but what we saw with the Adidas example was that they were able to actually shift production back to Germany because of increased automation. There is a chance, and we're not, I don't know how likely it is, but there is a chance that if automated manufacturing happened to its fullest extent, you could argue that that manufacturing process could be done in almost any country, right? Including India and including other existing manufacturing centers. So it's not to say they'd be excluded, but it would certainly be feasible to manufacture diamonds, whether they're lab-grown or natural. You could end up in a situation, for instance, you took lab-grown, cut and polish it. You grow the stone in America, cut and polish it in America, and, and, and sell it to an American consumer, to Jim's point. But Biju, when you were listening to the automated manufacturing panel, and you heard about the, the inevitability of a much less labor-intensive cutting and polishing process. What was your thinking with regard to your own business? <coughs> Thank you, it's an interesting question. But you know, uh, as a businessman or as a bank, uh, what we know that the production center is not very geography uh, specific. Uh, what is, uh, what is uh, specific is an entrepreneur's view to be in a business where it is profitable. Today, if I see the diamond business uh, from India, because across the value chain, Indian entrepreneurs are working. If it's India, or if it's Dubai, or if it's in Antwerp, or if it's in US, except probably in the retail side, uh, in outside India. So if people have invested and they understand this business and across geographies they are doing whatever they are doing, like you know, uh, if you see the supply side, if the, today the auctions, the goods that people buy in auctions are more profitable than they are buying probably from uh, the mining companies. So you see your auction part is going and congratulations to you for coming out with this. So, uh, the, here also the people are Indians, and that is also there in Antwerp. So, the people, uh, if a type of only a small part is the manufacturing, mm -hmm. if that manufacturing happens uh, and it's automated, whether it will be done in India, like you very rightly said, or in Germany, uh, probably the ownership of such business will continue to be with Indians. And uh, we are financing a promoter. So, as a, biz, as a banker, as a bank also, we are not geography sensitive. Uh, you know, it's, geography is today history. Nobody bothers where what is located. So now the other part is how I look at as an Indian for the job losses that will probably take place with the artisans that they are engaged in this business. Uh, in the previous panel, David said when Sorin came, people thought probably it will take away the probably the you know workforce but that didn't happen uh, people will adapt adapt and probably master that too and create machines which are cheaper when it initially comes it will be probably expensive but maybe after some time those machines will be available uh, locally made in india and they can do that work there and people will move to another business uh, you will be, ob obsolescence is a part of everything. Mm. So if a person is not today doing this, he's not born to do this work only, he can do something else, things will be found out. I think that's, you know, that's a very interesting point. I know we've got a lot to try to get through in yeah. this panel, 
And I want to move on to Diamond Financing. And Davey, you are one of the leading bankers here in Dubai. How do you see Diamond Financing evolving in the next couple of years? It's a heavy question. Um, <laughs> it's a fact that we have seen uh, more and more banks exiting the industry, uh, much to not to our liking of uh, Biju and myself. Uh, we like to share the risk around a little bit more than grow our, our books only. Um, now, the reasons why all these traditional banks, like my ex-bank, uh, Antwerp Diamond Bank, uh, has gone out, or SEB, who is running down their book, or ABN, who is closing shop here in Dubai, each and every bank has their own specific reasons uh, why they are doing such. And there's very few new banks entering because there is a scarcity of capital globally. Banks have so much options in what they want to put their capital into. And then, if you are honest, our business is not a very large business on a global scale. Anywhere where you check, uh, you get the numbers of anywhere between 10 to 13 billion dollars of diamond financing cr across the globe, which is not huge. So, if you're a bank and you have to have some spare capital which you have to deploy somewhere, are you going to put it in some commodity like diamonds, mm -hmm. where you have FATF and other instances mm -hmm. making you very scared even so, before you get yeah, into it? So, to kind of quickly kind of jump straight in there, and sorry to interrupt, the question then would be, if there's a scarcity of capital, and as a bank, you can put it anywhere, and you've got to choose to actively put it in diamonds, just in, in, in 30 seconds, what would make the diamond industry more attractive for a banker to come in and, and, and give more capital? I don't think it's going to happen that more banks are going to come in, to be very much honest. <laughs> now, what I, what I do think that's going to happen, and what you see happening now, is that more and more diamond companies are going to find their way to capital markets, hedge funds, alternative finance providers are going to pick up where banks are leaving off. Mm. What I think you already see, uh, a couple of people in the audiences uh, which are running around from these alternative financing vehicles. And you don't only see this in diamonds. More and more trade finance, is getting let go by traditional banks mm -hmm. and has been taken over by alternative methods of finance. So I think that's a truth which is out there, which we have to acknowledge. I think, Biju, a question for you on this, just on, on financing, would be, do you feel the industry actually has too much financing, the right amount of financing, or too little? Uh, I, I think is uh, the, this has been talked about that one of the problem is probably the midstream center having less finance. I don't see the problem in India is liquidity. Uh, liquidity issue and the solvency issue with the diamond tears are very much integral to the problem. So the liquidity is a function of their solvency, that how much liquidity a bank can make available to a customer that has a bearing with their capital. Uh, and if I look around in this audience uh, and look at the faces of my clients from India, none of them have any liquidity problem. Mm. They have problem of profitability. If they are doing less business, that's because their business has been less profitable. So, the, uh, to uh, answer your question, and that is uh, uh, to whether the, the business, uh, sorry, uh, I think that was Devi's question. Uh, what you but feel free to answer it, by all means. <laughs> <laughs> no, the They're banks are leaving this business. You know, banks are a financial intermediary. They will be looking at the return on capital or the return on the risk-weighted assets to uh, uh, demarcate or to allocate capital to a business. And the banks uh, sometimes make their own mistakes. They uh, walk in to do a business without doing adequate homework. 
so whether all the diamond tears are bad uh, and the diamond business is bad, that I don't agree. Because we have been in this business for a very long time and we don't see at any point of time that uh, these things are too bad or anything. What we have seen uh, that slowly, slowly, with the help of uh, mining companies, uh, DBS, that is the best practice principles have been set in, and now IFRS related balance sheets are coming. Diamond businesses had a specific problem where the balance sheet capital is a function of the valuation of the inventory, since this business hardly had any uh, capital assets, it's all inventory and receivables. So that created a bit of a problem uh, for a long time and that is still not completely resolved. And that's an issue which uh, banks uh, and with the help of the mining companies are struggling for some time. And I think that should be settled and alternate finance would require more transparency, integrity uh, in the numbers and the underlying cash flows. So to move to that sort of a uh, model, I think uh, we have seen that has been already uh, been done by Dilip Bhai sitting just here. Uh, he's the first one who started this uh, to go to alternate places to for funding. Uh, but that has uh, that requires more uh, more declarations, more clarity, more integrity. I mean, one one other question on this. I mean, and actually, Jim, coming to you, is that from time to time, miners have flirted with the idea of offering credit themselves, and in theory, they're well placed to do so because they are the most credit worthy people in the supply chain. Our Rosa as a mining stock has done extremely well. Uh, Anglo has done very well recently as well. So there's good capital markets behind organizations like that. Dominion itself was sold to a, to a private firm and again at a, at a valuation at that time that was seen as quite positive and bullish. So what is your view of miners themselves offering financing and funding the midstream to some extent? In the UK I go to my local pub right, and there's a sign on the wall that says Barclays doesn't sell beer and we don't give credit. Okay. <laughs> I think that's a little bit, uh, how can I say, extreme as a way of thought. Of course it's a discussion. You know, I, 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 earlier on I said, look, we, 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 got, we, we have relationships with our clients. We know we've been with them many years in, in various uh, incarnations that, that we've been. So we, we know their businesses, we understand their businesses, and we, we work with them to make sure their businesses are always growing. So. To, to actually be part of financing that, I think, is a very serious discussion that mm. uh, we will be continuing to have uh, mm. going down the downstream. Martin, How you would structure it, I don't know, but, sure. but I think it's a, a very, very, uh, probably a, a possible development in the future. Martin, with your experience in mining more generally, you know, you've not been in diamonds all your life, and were there examples of financing where miners gave, sold on credit? Uh, to their customers, and how do they work out? Um, yes, uh, is the simple answer. Um, when I worked in BHP Billiton, we sold 27 different commodities, and 26 of them were sold on credit. And everybody wanted to be in the diamond position, which was to sell for cash, so <laughs> on a prepayment basis. The envy amongst my peers were was, was enormous, and it meant that I could have a much simpler operation because I didn't need to have a huge credit review team uh, to review all the letters of credit, letters of intention. That said, it was also a different business because you pick up the goods in a, in a paper bag. Mm. Uh, a nice bag, but uh, still in a bag, rather than on a ship which takes three months to get to its destination. Mm. Um, so the lead times are different. So I think all miners selling commodities would love to get into the diamond position, which is saying on a, selling on a prepayment basis. Mm. But they have to be realistic that they cannot do. Looking forward, I, um, I agree with Jim, totally. I think it's something that miners will have mm. to look at and, and review. But I would also question, does the industry need more credit? Mm. And are some of the technical innovations that we heard about today going to potentially change the way mm. that dynamic works? Mm. 
because at the moment we see very long lead times in that manufacturing process and your financing inventory. Um, with the technology that we heard about today, is it possible to shorten that lead time? And what's that going to do with the credit times that the banks need to lend? Mm. And therefore, the risk that they're exposed to, so therefore more credit can come in. I want I to, I want to um, come back to that in a moment. I know there are a couple of remarks here. I think, Davey, can I quickly ask you this, just in, in kind of, just to react to two, <coughs> two quick questions. One is, how do you feel as a banker if miners started offering credit? And second of all, the idea of some of these developing shortening the supply chain or the time to market, how will that affect credit lending? <coughs> just two very, I know they're very different questions. If you could just give a quick answer on those, that'd be great. Um, if miners would start giving credit, <coughs> I know they have already a lot of skin in the game with their capital expenditure, but then let's say that there might be some clients which are on don't want to say which miners list, that maybe should not be there. And then if they have to give credit to these people, then I think that's an offset. Then on the other side, uh, the second question? Uh, was about some of these developments on, say, automated manufacturing that would reduce the, the yeah. pipeline. If the pipeline yeah. reduces, your working capital requirement goes down. If your working capital requirement goes down, your overall bank borrowing or need for financing goes down, which indeed, as Martin was saying, then our risk goes down, but also our business goes down. Uh, but as, as per my um, <coughs> own calculations, I see in the next three to five years around $3 billion going out of uh, bank, bank finance in this industry, uh, which will probably be partly resolved with shorter working capital requirements. Jim, to what extent do you believe, you know, given where everything is headed, you know, in terms of automated manufacturing, some of the disruptions that we're seeing in lab grown, the current market conditions, do you fundamentally believe in the midstream model as things stand, the way the business is conducted between miner and retailer? I, I think the, the, the midstream model is extremely effective. It's, it's a family-run business uh, that has embraced technology uh, through, through, through Sarin and various other projects uh, and, and really moved, moved on. And, and really, I think, embraced now uh, the responsibility they have for our product. And, we, okay, there, there have been uh, problems, shall I say, in the past, and there will be a couple of problems probably in the future. But I think that the uh, reliability of the midstream is extremely high. Um, and, and I think that the players have been in it, even though it's probably a reasonably easy one to enter and to exit. They've been in there a significant number of years. Mm. They've invested time, they've invested their family, and they, they can see the future. So do I have faith in the midstream? Totally. Um, I still have my dream about polishing up in the, up in the, up at the mine site, but, but uh, you know the clients I work with, I'm I'm, I'm proud to work with, very sure. proud to work. With. I'm conscious of time. We're about ten past five, and I know that people's stamina is at some point going to going to wane. Can I invite questions from the audience? There is one question on my iPad. There's only been one, so if you guys, while I ask that, think of other questions. The question is, and I think this one is more to do with. I, I pose this to you, Biju. Private equity funds, could they give financing to the midstream? How do you feel about that? If they give, it's good, so that we have partners in this business. Uh, we have multiple banks in that if there is a mining company, that's very positive. Uh, will it impact the bank borrowings? Uh, yes, it may a little bit impact, but it is not completely going to take away. It will also probably make them a responsible player that the money that they give uh, is going to be invested in a profitable venture. Today, uh, we, w we don't know the industry pricing because we are not dealing in goods, we are only intermediary. So I would welcome that very much. Does anyone have any questions from the audience or want to make a comment either on any of the topics we've discussed at this panel 
or any of the topics we've covered in earlier panels that they felt they didn't get a chance to ask. Stefan is... Stefan. Thank you. For the bankers, uh, we've seen an interesting development in terms of the uh, increase number of people in the banking sector dealing, not dealing with business, but dealing with compliance. Now, um, what are you in, you know, we were talking about technology, we're talking about artificial intelligence, and so on. Um, I would like to make a comment that part of the situation we're in, and I believe you will need to agree, we had situation, very regrettable situation, of a serious lack of ethics by a minority of players which have impacted bankers. This is a reality we're dealing with. Now, what are you going to implement in terms of the uh, opportunities that technology and AI offers in terms of securing a better control on the flow of transactions that bankers now need to check? Davy, do you want to take that first? Um. Stefan, if you find a solution, please let me know. I've been uh, breaking my head over this for the last 10 years. Um, no. Although I very much am a big fan of platforms like Tracer and all these uh, blockchain technologies and all these things, which should theoretically make it feasible to follow the commodity all the way through the pipeline. Now, a little bit of the problem I'm seeing with it, maybe it's because I'm not very tech savvy or how would I say? 90% of the business is in the small goods. Now, everybody of course always starts these technological things with the high end side of the goods because first of all, they are much more easy to identify on a single stone basis. But the reality of the business is that 90% of the stones is actually in the smalls. Plus, to follow it through the pipeline needs all the participants in the pipeline to be part of the platform, because otherwise there is a link missing. Now, that being said, if there is bad intent, if there is bad intent, because it's such a movable asset, you might be very well aware that company XYZ in Surat, in this road, behind that shop, uh, in front of that other shop, uh, you might identify where that is. If that guy decides to run away with the diamonds in his pocket, what are you going to do? Now, you can have a digital how would I say, property document for those diamonds. The moment you recut them a little bit, you can't match them anymore. So in theory, yes, perfect. But in reality, as long, especially with an asset such movable as diamonds and easily manipulable as diamonds, as long as you don't have physical control over them, all the rest I don't see how this is. I mean, I think a kind of a follow-up question would be on this. And, you know, D Dave, either feel free to comment on this and bid you if you want to jump in is, could you end up with a two-tier market where if initiatives, traceability initiatives do come to fruition and they are successful, and, but it doesn't take the entire market with it, that you have financing where you've got full traceability and financing where you don't have full traceability, and one type of financing is cheaper and, and easier to administer than the other. But ev even if you have full traceability, we have seen it in the past, you finance a site, the stones should be in your, forget further down the pipeline, the stones should be in your own client's safe. The guy gets on a plane, disappears, there's no stones in the safe. Forget traceability, you know that the stones should be there, the stones are not there. Okay, does anyone have other comments or questions? 
Uh, with large amounts of bank finance leaving the market, um, do you see hedge funds, private credit funds continuing to step in to fill the void? And do you see that happening directly or principally via securitization structures? So we've uh, tried to cover some of this, and I think, Dave, you've taken a, a stance on this. Biju, do you want to just jump in here and answer that question? <coughs> A little bit tossed up in it while uh, answering about the banking uh, finance. One is uh, currently the bankers are facing problem like uh, Stephen asked. Uh, risk management and compliance are very uh, same thing because you are trying to see the funds flows and the trade flows and all the cash flows half underlying trade flows. So if you are controlling those trade flows and uh, packaging it together and making a product, then probably it becomes like any other financial uh, instrument. There and his fund can come and finance. That should not be any problem. <clears throat> but uh, if you are thinking traditional financing like uh, and diamond tears need for purchase, purchase finance for buying raw on a cash basis and holding an inventory for manufacturing and sending their goods and memo to say American retailers, then how you pack it together to a bundle and under that underlying financial asset you finance from a hedge fund, that becomes a challenge. So the funding part from the hedge funds is very welcome, but they have to, we today, we do not have very defined products and whatever products have with very compliant companies, they have been handful in the last uh, 15 years. And we are not seeing more and more such products coming and playing uh, a role in this business. So yes, just, that's welcome. Yeah. So what I want to do is just quickly ask one question to the panelists, and then I just think we should probably wrap up. Davey, your quick question is this. If, how can you help as a banker in your role, how can you help a diamond company develop a long-term strategy? Look, we as NBF, we have a saying that we want to be a partner. And it's not just a marketing exercise. We really want to be a partner. We have, in all our different verticals, industry specialists. I've been doing this now for almost 15 years. We really treat this as relationship banking. We sit with the clients, and we try to give them as best advice as possible to what is your long-term strategy. Is your long-term strategy to go to capital markets? We will help you do that. Is your long-term strategy better served by having bilateral facilities from one bank, multiple banks, we will advise you to do that. But that's where I'm always pleading on my clients, please work with us as a partner. And especially in the life cycle of a company, it will not only be rosy when times are tough like now, please confide in us. We are not the boogeyman, we don't want to, we want to work with you, to understand where your business is going and work with you and try to make it as best as possible for you yep. and for us. Thank you very much. BJ, quick question for you. If you, were, uh, if you were with a client who is considering bringing the next generation, their sons, hopefully there'll be some daughters one day in these diamond businesses too, <laughs> but the next generation coming into the business, uh, they're kind of 2021. 20, the, the current promoters are asking your advice, should they come into the business or not? What would your response be? Thank you. Uh, yes, that's a question which is there every day in my mind or before me. Because success and planning in a family-run enterprise is a key question to define or to assess the risk of a company. So on a daily basis or an annual basis, we are looking at what sort of success and planning this company is having and how capable and uh, qualified the second generation is to take over the business or third generation is. 
and if they ask me whether my son should join the business or otherwise that question is also have been uh, uh, put to me many times that depends on how sustainable your business is and how quickly you can adapt to changing circumstances and navigate through the changing times that uh, probably answers how uh, whether you will bring him or not and many companies are constantly reinventing themselves they are adapting to the changing circumstances and the challenges and finding out Uh, solutions if they can do they can probably count on the goodwill of the father and then take it forward in a different direction uh, uh, or in the similar direction if it is sustainably profitable uh, that should be the thank answer you. thank you very much i and jim if you take everything into account the short term and the long term what do you see as the biggest opportunities for diamonteers today I think really it is to integrate themselves and get into the marketing put some skin in the game as it were I mean come with us on the DPA journey because I think that's very very important it's very important we get the right message and the message comes from them and you talk about uh, getting younger people into the business it, it is with greatest respect to you all quite frightening how much grey hair there is in this in our business at the moment <laughs> i'm not obsessed with hair but i mean they're, they're, we just need the younger people to bring the energy you do have the most hair on this panel <laughs> on, your, on your head that is yes but it's the wrong color <laughs> no. we seriously need to engage with young people to make sure that we have a business in 10 years time we've invested that we invest in training young people we bring young people along with us so everybody has to to play that part in that so i think that is our sustainability goal people and the product i'd like to make you know thank you all uh and make a special uh, applause to the last panel it's very tough being here at the end of the conference very grateful that you could be with us so thank you very much